I will stop here for the moment, but before doing this, I would also like to mention that uh, uh, as uh, Abu Qasim, my good friend Abu Qasim mentioned, this is for the third time that uh, we are uh, uh, celebrating the Anti-Corruption Day in coincidence with uh, the celebration of uh, the award. And uh, the first two were held uh, in Vienna and in Geneva in uh, six, nine, uh, 2016 and 2017. When we started, we could not think that uh, going through the work and going through the uh, uh, conduct of uh, this award, uh, so many applications could have been received. It was a lot of work for, uh, first uh, for the ROLAC secretariat to try to uh, 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 go through all of them, uh, do all the necessary checks before submitting them. There is an advisory board, as you well know, and, uh, uh, and there is an high level committee which uh, has to approve the advisory board recommendations. Uh, I had uh, uh, the honor and the pleasure of having been a member of the advisory board, and uh, there are some other colleagues who have uh, worked together with me through the years uh, in order to transform this uh, dream in a reality and uh, I wish to again uh, 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 thank all those colleagues for their hard work, uh, particularly our host, Abu Qasim, and uh, I, he doesn't need any introduction or anything, he's well known to everyone here. And uh, the other colleague was uh, uh, my dear friend uh, Edward Ose. Uh, former uh, anti-corruption uh, anti commissioner of uh, Tanzania. Please. <laughs> Professor Ugi Zvekic, former ambassador of Yugoslavia to the United Nations in Geneva. <laughs> and former colleague of mine for many years in, uh, in the United Nations Secretariat. And uh, uh, Francois, Professor Francois Amélie from the Sorbonne University, Professor of Law, uh, who has been uh, uh, working very hard together with us uh, to make sure that we were going to select and or to recommend the best candidate for the, for the award. Having said this, I think that uh, since the, the time is running, uh, I will, for the moment, stop here in order to have uh, the winners and the champions being introduced so that uh, they can uh, give their own message to all of you and uh, on the basis of that to have a discussion with them, uh, to learn about their experience, to see what uh, the, 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 the importance of the work, not only for their countries, but uh, for the entire international community. And uh, from here, to try to uh, get some lessons for the future, which uh, may be useful for uh, all of us. So thank you again very much for your attendance. And uh, let's make this uh, meeting extremely, extremely fruitful. Thank you. May I invite the winners of the Lifetime or Outstanding Achievement Category win Award winners, Mr. Nuhuri Badu and Mr. Leonard McCarthy.
when offered $15 million and a foreign house to pervert the course of justice, what would you do? Faced with this dilemma, Nuhu Rabadu, chairman of Nigeria's Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, accepted the money and then used it as evidence to prosecute and convict the source of the funds. This is the level of integrity that Mr. Rabadu has displayed throughout his career in public life. He indicted his one-time boss, successfully recovering $150 million for the state of Nigeria and was instrumental in removing Nigeria from the Financial Action Task Force's global list of non-cooperative countries and territories. Nuhu Rabadu regularly inspires youths to become the change they seek. At the fourth edition of Project Mentor Me, organized by a non-profit group in Abuja, he got the audience to take a critical look at their life choices and how it shapes their future. He argues that actions instead of words are the only way to end corruption. His actions focus on his home country of Nigeria and the corruption that robs the state of huge sums of money while stagnating development. He cites improving the foundations of leadership, institutions and individuals as the key requirements for anti-corruption success in any nation, saying if things are not done in the right way, Cutting corners will always continue. <laughs> Mr. Ribado, my dear friend Wu, please, you have the floor. Uh, good morning, everyone. As you can see, I'm really excited. So, uh, especially, you know, I, I'm in the midst of my own colleagues. I can see my own comrades. I can see those all my life I've spent my time working with. So it's extremely exciting to be with you this morning. Uh, but first of all, to give my own thanks. Uh, we are very grateful, and uh, you can see honestly uh, the excitement in us. Since we got into this country, it has been just wonderful. Uh, Malaysians are wonderful people, very nice, and you have very good food, I think. Maybe I will put on a bit of weight before I go back to Nigeria. Uh, I, I want to thank uh, the leaders, uh, our own leaders, the Sheikh Al-Thani, uh, the Prime Minister Mahati. Since Friday, when these announcements were made, it was all over the news in my own country. And uh, I can assure you, these two leaders can win elections in Nigeria and Africa. They are, they are wonderful people. If you ask me, I will tell you probably they are the best in terms of real good what a leader should be. They are getting it right. This initiative is probably unique, better than any, because I don't think there is any better way you can help humanity today than to encourage poor countries to do things properly and correctly. These awards that you are given may not be, you may not understand the impact and how much in terms of what it can play in helping poor countries, developing countries, to get it right. The only difference between poor countries and the developed countries is just the way we manage ourselves. A lot of times, the resources are there. The resources are with the poor countries as well, just like the rich countries, but how we manage it, how we make good use of it, how we convert it to something that can help us improve our lives, growth and development, is the difference between the rich countries, the 
well-developed countries and the underdeveloped countries. Initiatives like this help us to do the right thing. It encourages us. And someone like me standing before you, my story is an answer to everything that you have tried to, the message that you are sending. Because all my life I have worked in the law enforcement. All my life I have worked fighting corruption, law and order, rule of law. I had a chance for me to set up uh, the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission in Nigeria. I don't need to tell you about Nigeria. I'm sure a lot of you will know, must have heard about a country, Nigeria in Africa. Fairly rich, rich. Number seven in oil produce, uh, as an oil producing country in the world. We make over $50 billion a year annually. But if you go there, it's sad, it's tragic. Nothing much to show for that. Nigeria used to be at the bottom of the transparency international list uh, ratings as most corrupt countries. Nigeria became a poster country for corruption. It was sad, it was tragic. We had to, at a point, be almost blacklisted outside the financial system in the world. The FATF did, did that to us. It was a terrible, terrible situation. And that was when I got a chance for me to set up and uh, uh, lead the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission. Something similar to probably what you have, even though I understand maybe it's a little bit different. Uh, that was in 2003. Before then, I was a police officer. Before then, I was a lawyer a qualified lawyer, believing that the best way I can help my country probably is to go into law enforcement. I decided to go join as a regular police officer and also a prosecutor. I will tell you a bit about what happened to me because somehow my own story is a reflection of what a country uh, attempted or tried to do in addressing the problem of corruption. Yes, at the time when we started, it was zero. Nigeria never had one single conviction. Nobody was ever brought before a court for over 50 years of our own independence. Nobody was ever convicted. Yet we were one of the most corrupt countries in the world. We said working. Young people like me, uh, we said that, okay, it is time that let the corrupt also pay dearly for their own misdeeds. For decades, the poor people are paying. Now, let's go after those who are behind it. But before then, we had to set up a strong foundation, an institution that is enduring, that can work. We work extra from the beginning to go out to look for the best in terms of training uh, and those who we can learn from. I went out, I went to FBI, I went to Metropolitan Police, I went to BKK of Germany, I reached out to the European Union. European Union alone gave me about 30 something million euros. Most of the money that we used, we got it from outside because it was so difficult for us to even get the money from the parliament in Nigeria. When you say you are fighting corruption, it's long, nobody wants to talk to you. People run away from you. And off we started working, few of us, probably less than 200 as a beginning. We started going after, we prioritized we adopted what we then call suitable target for maximum impact. We moved from where, you know, the low-hanging fruits, and then gradually we moved up. We started with those who scammers, 419, because our responsibility was to enforce all economic crimes. We used to have what we call 419, advanced fee fraud. Frosters would sit in Nigeria, do scam and send letters, and take money. Within a period of two months, we rounded that most of, if not all of them. One case of an individual who took close to about $200 million from Brazil. We brought him back, we got him. I personally went after him, I arrested him myself. He offered me half of the money to let him go. Yes, $75 million. This is what tells you about fighting corruption. We brought him to justice. We rounded them all. We returned the money to the victims across the, country, the world. We took the next step. We went after the revenue departments of, of, in our country. Those like the NMPC oil company, the revenue department, customs and so on. We went after them. And we brought them to justice. We were starting from the scratch. We went after the police, the Nigerian police force. As a police officer myself, 
I brought the Inspector General of Police to justice. I got him in jail. He was my boss. Yes. When you are fighting corruption, it has to be that resolved. You have to understand that there is no half way in doing it. Issues to do with commitment, passion, and zeal is so central. It is not the normal work that you take it the way it is done somewhere. Something has to be extra for you to make an impact. We went after politicians. It was the most difficult one. For the first time in the history of, the, of my country, you see politicians in handcuffs being brought to court, to justice. We got governors convicted. Governors are very powerful. We went after the leadership the, at the highest level, ministers and so on. Today, the EFCC that we created, uh, this year alone recorded close to about 800 convictions. Billions and billions of dollars return. From one single person, our own former head of state called General Sani Abacha, maybe you might have heard about it. We recovered a return to Nigeria over a billion dollars. But that comes along with the danger. I have lost many of my own colleagues. And because there is no time, I will just give you just a summary of little, little things that I thought is important. And also to explain to you what it involves when you are doing this type of work. Personally, myself, I survived two assassination attempts. I had to leave my country. The night, the last time I was attacked, I had bullets spread on my vehicle. I ran out of the country. At the time when I left Nigeria, I didn't have nothing. And that's why, you know, this initiative like what you're doing, coming up to help those people who are in the forefront, the physical people who are in the forefront of this war, matters a lot. When I left Nigeria, I didn't have 200 pounds of my own. Nothing. I left. I went with a motorcycle out of my country and got into another country, and then somehow I ended up getting into the UK. First of all, I went to, uh, I got uh, a place in Oxford, Oxford University. And I think I stayed in the flat that was vacated by uh, one of your own, Anwal Ibrahim. Uh, he was, yes, it was his flat that I moved in when he left. And that was the beginning. I left. I, I stayed in my own in exile for about two years uh, outside Nigeria with nothing. I have family. I have my wife. I have my kids, and so on and so forth. So, just to explain to you, uh, really, there are people like that all who are out there who will need your help, who will need your support. And the message you are sending right now is that yes, those who are doing this work, that the world will be with you. We are not going to abandon you. You are doing an amazing job. This is the greatest service you can do to humanity, especially the poor. Nothing else you can help than to preserve the little resources that they have so that they can use it very well and also show that indeed the bad people will not have a place to hide. The world is not going to allow them to enjoy what they have really been so, um, fear, I mean, denying their own people. Uh, that is some of the things that happened to me as an individual. And I'm so excited when I saw what was going on, when I see the initiatives, uh, uh, how uh, it can help to encourage the people who are doing it. Coming back to the EFCC itself, I, uh, at the time when we started it, we understood somehow, because of my experience in the past as a police officer and also a prosecutor, uh, in Nigeria, like I told you, we never had convictions until when we got in we decided to somehow address some of the problems we faced in the past. The EFCC became one center where the law enforcement, the prosecutors, everybody will be under one roof, one leadership. Things from beginning to the end, to the, end the intelligence, the investigation itself, the prosecution itself, uh, everything comes under one roof. And I think it's extremely very important to understand that sometimes Bringing everybody into one fall makes a huge difference. In our own case, it helped us. Before then, we used to, one department would do investigation. Attorney General would take over the other one. This one is disconnected. Some of the things that we learned is that bringing everybody into one fall makes a big difference in the work you are doing. 
is some of the things that help us to really uh, uh, overcome some of the challenges that were faced in the past. As a result of it, of course, like I told you, uh, within a short period of time, even the transparency international rating started climbing up. Today, Nigeria rose about 14 in the least, which is an indication that it worked. Some of the few things that also help in this work is also leadership. Leadership at the political level and leadership at the level of the work that we are doing. You need honest, good leaders. I can see what is happening in your own country today because the world is a global village. Whatever happens in Malaysia is all over. We know how Dr. Mahati uh, got back after long years outside power and what he did in the past and what he has met now and what he is trying to do. We have a very similar story in Nigeria. General Buhari, Muhammadu Buhari, he was a head of state in 1983-84. We forced him to come back two years ago to do the same thing. And uh, leadership is central in this attempt to address problem of corruption. Uh, if you do not have a leader that is above board, that will not be able to be part of this mess, that will not sit with people in transactions, then chances are the lower part will also do the same thing. You will get good cabinet, you will get good ministers, you will get others. It's the same thing at the law enforcement level. You need good, honest law enforcement people. There is no compromise on that. Corruption can never fight corruption. Any corrupt law enforcement officer shouldn't in any way be near this type of work. At, go, if you are able to achieve that, the next thing, of course, is demobilization, which I understand is doing very well, because you need people to come in, everybody, buy into it, explain it, so that everybody will participate. Somehow, this work can be a success if every single individual within the community, within the society, understood exactly what is going on, and also will contribute and participate in it. It has helped us in Nigeria because within the EFCC itself, we had a unit that is responsible, what we call Fix Nigeria Initiative, where we go out, reach out to the religious leaders, community leaders, traditional leaders, youth, and so on, and mobilization was very, very central to that work. People need to understand that integrity pays, that dishonesty, dishonesty is the worst kind of behavior, and that religions do not encourage people to be criminals, that a leader should not be a thief. Because when you are corrupt, you are a thief. You are just a common thief. No difference. People need to understand this type of thing. And it's only possible when you carry out a mass mobilization to bring everybody into it. You also need to walk and reach out to others. For example, what we did at the EFCC level, some of the things that we succeeded was simply because we reached out. We got, to, for example, Metropolitan Police to literally work for us to a point where even our own cases, they were taking it and even getting convictions on our behalf. We reached out to uh, DOJ, the Department of Justice in the US, uh, and, and the FBI. At a point, about 21 of the 26 cases handled by the Department of Justice, DOJ, in the US from their own foreign corrupt practices law came from Nigeria. They were our own cases. Some of the biggest cases, Harley Button, Siemens, and so they all emanated from us. How did we do that? We simply got them to understand that we were serious, we were prepared to address our own problems, and we need the world to come alone and help us. It's very critical when you do this type of work, you reach out. Corrupt money goes out. If it is outside your own shores, you will not be able to do much you need outside to help you and assist in the work you are doing. These are some of the things that somehow we were able to, uh, somehow get it, uh, we got it right, and it helped to turn the EFCC today as probably one of the most successful anti-corruption institu uh, in the world today, based on the results of what uh, we were able to achieve. I've continued with my life. I was, I was, like I told you, I was sacked, I was kicked out, I left my country. The president who kicked me out because he disagreed with me died, I went back to Nigeria. And I decided to participate in politics. I'm now in politics. It's important 
people should join in because it's only at the political level that people will be able to effect meaningful changes. It's tough. When you don't have money, it's difficult. But be there. Don't run away. All of you, especially people who are doing this type of work, please, after your work, go to politics. Join. <laughs> don't run away. And you can make a difference. Today, I've involved myself. I'm trying as much as I can what can be done to clean up the politics of buying votes, of uh, you know, uh, fin uh, party financing and things like that. And if by any chance, if they elect me, I'm going to do work and I'm going to be there, I will continue to be there. The corrupt are not happy, but I will continue to make them unhappy because they will continue to see me there. I will be there. Hopefully one day, one day, maybe something will happen. I'm involved in a few other things. For example, mentorship. Mentorship is about bringing others. Be a role model, even to, at your own family level, at your community level, at the larger society. Always be an example of what others will be able, especially those who are learning. I'm doing that, especially with the law enforcement. Uh, people don't understand or appreciate the impact and the magnitude the effect of those who are in the law enforcement in countries. They play the most important role, yet it's not a glamorous work. Often it's unrewarded. We need to encourage young, talented, quality people to join the law enforcement. I'm doing this type of work in my own country, telling them it is necessary. If Nigeria is going to change, we need people who will come in, smart, intelligent people, who will be in the law enforcement, who will be prosecutors. At the same time, also, those who are even in the civil society, ability for them to even do more. It's very critical uh, getting them at early age matters a lot because it will help in defining tomorrow. I'm doing that as well. I'm also involved a little bit and also encouraged by this award that comes in now in support of uh, initiatives like the whistleblowing Whistleblowing is new in my own country. We just had the law. And it is working. It's amazing. House boys, drivers are whistleblowing the whistles against their bosses. We are getting billions and billions of money back. And we are getting people convicted. We are encouraging people to understand it and do it more. So that there will be no hiding place for anyone. Freedom of information. Some of these laws are new in, our, in my country. But they are, these are tools that are today available in the world. Every country, if you want to utilize it, you can get it. Because a lot of uh, development agencies have worked so much. United Nations have done a lot of work. We have the ANCAC, we have the conventions, we have the protocols, we have so many things. Everything today is available for any country to use, make good use of. To, that will help in accountability and transparency in governance. We imported a lot of them into my, in our own country. We are working extra to get it introduced to our own people so that it will make a difference in our lives. This is my story, and I can assure you this is the best way you can help your own country at this moment. Some of the countries like my own deserve this type of, because people have suffered. The people have been duped. Few individuals took advantage of their own positions. I think it is time let them pay for their own misdeeds. Let's save our own people for continuing to pay for the bad behavior of our few leaders. Thank you very much. God bless you. I am in your hands. I don't know if uh, probably I will give the floor directly now to the other uh, winner, uh, to the other champion, so that at the end we can have some questions for both of them. Okay, please, my dear Leonard, you have the floor after a short introduction also about you. There are perhaps only a handful of people who can be credited with shaping the global economy. And Mr. Leonard Frank McCarthy is one of them. 
As Vice President of the World Bank, he has spearheaded initiatives designed to increase the organization's ability to address fraud and corruption. Under his leadership, integrity due diligence has become a standard of World Bank investigations, and under his guidance, a World Bank Preventative Services Unit was created to ensure that potential corruption could be stopped before it had even begun. Prior to joining the World Bank, Mr. McCarthy successfully prosecuted many entities involved in financial crime, organized criminal enterprises, grand corruption, urban terror, and money rackets as Directorat of Special Operations in South Africa. And before that, he served as the Director of Public Prosecutions in South Africa, appointed by Nelson Mandela. He is the founder and president of L.F. McCarthy Associates Incorporated, an international integrity risk management company based in Washington, D.C. Mr. McCarthy's expertise in negotiations, his firm grasp of global dynamics, and the ability to navigate the intersection between law, business, politics, and ethics have made him a powerful voice for the promotion of integrity in business. Thank you, thank you. Trabakasi, good morning. Salam alaikum. I hope everyone's well on this, uh, this fateful Monday. Um, and thank you to Rolex for that very nice uh, commendation and introduction. I, it made me blush, thinking that uh, I'm slightly lightheaded when I hear how I impacted the global economy, but uh, I'll, take, I'll take the compliment. Thank you very much. Uh, I did want to say that uh, if you look at me as Malaysians, you'll see my, this guy looks familiar. So uh, those who know your history will know that Malay people went to Cape Town in South Africa. So if you feel, uh, you feel like I look like a brother or sister, you want to adopt me or give me citizenship, uh, you know, I'll happily take that. Um, so, so thank you for, for the warm welcome. And again to, to Rolak uh, and, uh, and the Prime Minister's office, I think Friday was, was very special for all of us. We felt, uh, we felt a little warm around the, you know, uh, in our hearts because it doesn't always happen that you you get an acknowledgement like that. We were getting phone calls and WhatsApps from people we haven't had in 10 years' time. So that's a, that's a good indication of, of what the prizes mean, you know, the awards mean for us. So thanks again for that. Uh, I wanted to just say a few things about myself. And I, I spoke to Dr. Vittore, and he said, but you are entitled to brag this morning, so, uh, which, is, which is something that one should sometimes guard against. So if I come across too strong, you can just wave at me. Uh, I was a prosecutor in South Africa uh, when Nelson Mandela was uh, released from Robben Island, and uh, I minded my own business and worked very hard. Um, and eight years later, he appointed me as one of seven directors of public prosecutions. I was the youngest in the country, and, uh, and I was quite happy about that. Uh, the reason I mention that, especially to the people in the room who are investigators, prosecutors, lawyers, uh, um, forensic people, is, is uh, you know, good things can happen to you. You just need to be at the right place at the right time. Smile, be humble, work hard, and doors will open for you. Right? Then don't be too, don't be too negative about this corruption business because we can beat it. Uh, I think we. We, we have so many successes that we should celebrate, and, uh, and I think you know, the life stories of many of you are probably testimony to that. But that appointment opened doors for me because I then became the, the head of the Office for Serious Economic Offenses, uh, which has always been uh, filled by white people, but uh, the government said there must be some black person who can handle that position. Uh, one understands a little bit about how the world economy or the financial system works. And that, that then led to, to my appointment as the head of the Scorpions, which you probably have read about, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And, um, and then the World Bank came looking for a vice president for their program of institutional integrity, and I was the lucky man. 
and I've been living in the United States now for, this is my 11th year, and the reason I'm telling you the story is, for me, it is more 21 years of privilege and, and service than, 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 than sounding like someone who's been ostracized or victimized. I, I, I would really advise against that. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a defeatist attitude. I think one should make sure you land on your feet and, um, and, and be stronger than, than you know, the people who want to bring you down. Uh, I wanted to say a few things about, about the work that I did in South Africa and at the World Bank. Firstly, uh, you, know, the, 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 you have your own commission here, but I, I found that it, it, it really works if you try and combine uh, the corruption function, the financial crime uh, 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 di dimension of, uh, of crime and the, and the organized crime elements under a multidisciplinary approach. If you, if you have the teams working together and uh, you have trust and leadership and you can motivate them to believe that they can be better than what they are and they can do and achieve great things and they can punch above their weight, you will, you will have success. The second thing is that many lawyers, in, in, and I'm sure there are a few in the room, will tell you there's an old maxim about hard cases making bad law. And, um, you know, we have to do cases. That is really the, the asset test in the United States where I live. If you talk to, you know, the, 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 the prominent experts and the big voices on anti-corruption, they say the biggest deterrent against corruption is to prosecute the cases. Prosecute, prosecute, prosecute. We can have a lot of capacity building and making people aware of these things, but we need to prosecute uh, some of the big cases because that's critically important. Um, when I arrived at the World Bank, I was asked to redesign the whole uh, institutional architecture, and I wanted to say that the key element of that program was transparency. Uh, we sort of had to open up everything. We started disclosing the, the outcomes of investigations and reports. We started reporting on countries which are not acting, and we started doing an analysis that we previously have not embarked on. Now, if you look at life today, everything comes out. You know, uh, documents on which people record bribes, telephone conversations in which they conspire to murder other people, um, everything comes out, uh, 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 you know, agreements, uh, 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 between uh, you know corporations that are cooked in boardrooms to, to hide the the uh, the proceeds of crime, everything comes out. Uh, I'd almost venture to say in the U.S., 75 percent of misconduct, uh, whether it's cyber crime, corporate misconduct, political skullduggery, everything comes out. And so, for investigators and prosecutors, I would say it's walk into that space, exploit it, assuming that everything is either written down or recorded somewhere, especially with the use of email. Um, I also found that with all these cases we are looking at, whether you start from Enron to Odebrecht in Brazil, and I think in Malaysia I'll probably say from Enron to IMDB2, uh, someone misrepresented something and someone covered it up. Uh, those are the two key elements of all the misconduct that I've seen 21 years later. And then the other one, the other main, main phenomenon that I've seen, which I think uh, you should take into account is when you hear things like success fees, facilitation payments, uh, agent fees, commissions. In one of the World Bank investigations, I heard a new term called sunshine payments. So when you hear sunshine payments or commissions, you must know that there's trouble. Somebody is, is busy doing something that they should not because I, for the life of it, cannot understand why you always need an intermediary. Um, so that's just in sum what I've, you know, what I've seen. I've also created something at the World Bank called the International Corruption Hunters Alliance. I know it sounds like something from a James Bond movie, but uh, it, it united uh, you know, the part, the advanced economies and developing country enforcement authorities, at least for the, uh, for the uh, in, in nine years that I was there. And I think it would be good if we can look ultimately at how we sort of bring these alliances together in one, into one global network. We also um, created a cross-debarment regime so that, you know, when companies are debarred by one bank, 
that all the other international banks uh, do the same. A coalition of, of, of the willing. Um, and so as far as what I do today, <laughs> I, uh, you know, I, I established a firm uh, and we, it's an integrity, compliance, and anti-corruption practice. And the, the, it's only geared towards national authorities, the private sector, and international organizations who want to do the right thing. I don't litigate, I don't contest, uh, because it is against the grain of who I am. Uh, I also offer to assist countries in reviewing their anti-corruption architecture uh, and advise them on how best practice and policies can help them make, more, make them more effective as an investment destination. And then finally, uh, I assist, uh, offer to assist with international investigations, evaluating evidence gathering, review asset recovery strategies, which is a big thing, and serving as an integrity monitor um, in, in settlements and deferred prosecution agreements. In terms of the award, we were asked to say a few words about uh, what we intend to do with it. I haven't given it sufficient thought, but I'd like it to have a multiplier effect. You know, whilst I was at the World Bank, I advocated that we establish a restitution fund so that some of this settlement money in these big cases can flow through that fund and we can give assurance to the national authorities and the corporations who have to make those payments that the money doesn't disappear into a black hole when it goes back, but that it's actually used for appropriate purposes. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm considering how to to use the award to scope the contours of such a fund and probably get the right people on board, but I need to sleep on it a little more. Uh, I would also like to compile a compendium of lessons learned from major financial crime cases. I've, I've now worked with people, talked to people. When, when you look for all the information in one room or in one uh, resource or information about corruption, you've got to go and Google about 100 different uh, source documents. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, in the United States they have a Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, um, and many people have the same kind of law in, in their countries on foreign corrupt practices, but the application of those laws in multiple jurisdictions for me are not consistent. So I'd like to uh, look at how I could work with Rolex and others to to change the game a little bit in that area. But those are just some of my pre preliminary thoughts. I'm going to pause there and save you eight minutes because I think we'll do better when we engage with you and talk about this uh, and answer some of your questions. So thank you very much again, and, and thank you for listening to me. Tramakasi, thank you. Dear colleagues and friends, I think that we heard really two great champions of anti-corruption who have been uh, exposed and uh, who have been uh, really spent their professional life uh, both at the national and uh, at the international level in order to make some changes and make some changes that could affect the way not only in which corruption is perceived, but the way in which con con corruption is uh, actually dealt with, uh, 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 and therefore make an effort to at least, if not stamp out corruption, at least to reduce the consequences of corruption in the, both uh, at the country level and at the international level. For example, just to when the United Nations started to discuss about corruption, the first recommendations, the first resolution, before it was impossible to speak about. So for the first time, it was in 1975 at the fifth UN Congress on the Prevention of Crime and the Treatment of Offenders. Since then, some work started at the, UN, at the United Nations level to consider, to, to, to further progress, to make some recommendations, some resolutions. And an effort was made to discuss with the colleagues of the World Bank. At the time, we used to have, our boss was Margaret Anstey, yes. Under Secretary General, and 
they say, let's go now. There has been this resolution of the Congress against corruption. Let's see what we can do together with the colleagues of the World Bank. It was forbidden even to have a meeting to discuss between her and the director of the World Bank. At the time, there was a legal counsel who was against saying that this was interference in internal affairs, yeah. and therefore the meeting was canceled. So you can understand also the hard work of Leonard in having the, the mandate of reviewing completely the architecture of the work of integrity within the bank, etc. As you can understand the struggle of uh, NEO, not only in uh, establishing the financial uh, commission of financial crimes in uh, Nigeria, but the fact also of looking for funds in order to start to operate from abroad. So I think that uh, these, these are really the challenges that are met every day. And I will stop here because I would like now to have you to ask questions, to intervene. We still have a few minutes and therefore the floor is yours. Any question? Please. You can say your name, and after you make the question, to whom? All right. Please. My name, is, uh, my name is Yen, an ordinary citizen in Malaysia. Good. We need ordinary citizens. First of all, welcome my brother from Nigeria, No Wahala. <laughs> from my colleague from South Africa, we cannot offer you citizenship, but you can enroll in our Malaysian Second Home Program. We have many similarities with Nigeria, my brother. You mentioned you have your 419 scam, we have Macau scam here. You have your Sunny Abacha, we have Malaysian official number one. And uh, all, basically, we have so many similarities. From Abuja to Lagos, from Kano to Port Harcourt, we, in fact, borrowed oil, the oil pump from Cross River. Thank you very much. Kelapa sawit kita sebenarnya datang dari Nigeria. Getah datang dari Brazil. We borrowed, okay? And speaking of borrowing, in Africa before, they said, we want, can you, when you're facing dire straits of corruption, they said, can we borrow? Dr. Mahathir, just for six months. <laughs> Unfortunately, we cannot lend them to you because we need him more. <laughs> That's why we brought him back after May the 10th. So my question to you, sir, because to have integrity, to be not corrupted, it comes from your heart. To be offered 150 million US dollars or 75 million US dollars, I don't know how many of us here can turn it down. So I want to know from you. And by the way, another similarity. You left by motorcycle or what? I think you left through Benin. Our MACC chief got to leave the country too. Betul tak, Dato' Sri Shukri? I think we have had enough of this rubbish. Okay. We need people with integrity. So I want to ask you, very honestly, what is it that immediately you turn down the 75 million? Because we need to instill this spirit, this jati diri in all our civil servants. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank you very much, my brother. You are, you are a Nigerian. He, seems to, <laughs> he knows Nigeria as much as how I know Nigeria. And he's right. We have a lot of common things, uh, absolutely. And uh, it's just that we are, uh, in Nigeria, we are too many, 180 million people. So it's a big, big problem to manage the number. But uh, I can also tell you, uh, Mahati Muhammad is one of the most popular leaders in Nigeria. If he stands election there, he will win. 
So when he is finished with his tenure here, please send him. We still, we want him to come over there. Even though he has a brother in Muhammad Buhari, who is our present head of uh, president, he is very similar to him. He's very talking about the uh, in honesty and integrity. I think fundamentally, you know, people are made the way they are. A lot of times, also through upbringing, orientation, and also what the society plays in shaping people. Uh, in my own case, uh, at the risk of sounding a little bit this is it's simple it's just what is right and bad thing everybody knows is bad good thing people know what is good and it's always your own choice you can pick what you like you can be a religious person leader you can also be an arm robber it's your own choice a lot of times people are confronted with daily what makes them in my own case from the beginning maybe i, I um, my family somehow played a role uh, my 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 father oh, bless me wonderful human being genuinely honest person first politicians in nigeria he was a minister cabinet minister in the 60s and, but I, he lived an honest simple quiet life and when he died uh, we didn't get anything from him, and we are very happy, but we had a name, good name, and everybody respected that. Uh, uh, I, I personally, by nature, I somehow have satisfaction when I do what I consider the right thing. I want to fight for the weak. I hate injustice. I was a qualified lawyer with all the opportunities open to me, but I felt that maybe joining police might be the best that can give me happiness. When I get conviction, it's the greatest happiness, it's the adrenaline that goes in me. It's amazing. And when I see uh, somebody who takes advantage of others, a bully, somebody who is a cheat, is brought to his own level, I, I have that happiness and satisfaction. And I'm also grateful to God, maybe I'm not a material person. I'm fine. I have fine things. I'm okay. I, I look good. I'm okay. I've never wore, worn a wristwatch. I'm okay because I, the telephone gives me time. And simple things like this, it's okay. You, you, you have the same enjoyment with those who are getting the billions. And also, taking one dollar and taking a hundred million dollars is the same thing. It's all a criminal act. And the worst part is somebody who is responsible to fight for what is wrong turn out to be doing what is wrong. That's why it's unforgivable. For example, somebody in the judiciary, a judge taking money. It's unbelievable. Or a policeman taking money. You are employed to, do, to fight it. Then you turn yourself, you are the one doing it. You are the worst human being. You are, not, you are nothing. You are, you, it's a shame. So maybe some people, you know, find it okay. Others find it no. I don't know where I can put myself. The day I will take bribe from somebody, no. It's the lowest thing you can be as a human being. It's bad. I I I I am okay somehow doing my own normal thing and. Uh, be happy with it. I, I know that also I have God that I worship. I also believe in the religion that says whatever you do, you will account for it. If not here, hereafter. The day you will come when you stand before your Lord and account for your own deeds. And I, I am okay that I, I will prepare myself to be able to answer those uh, whatever that I have done in my own life. Uh, it also plays a bit of a role in that. But my, my brothers and uh, sisters, you people, you are the best in the society because you are the ones who are making sacrifice for the rest of us to live in peace, to, to stop the bad people, to correct those who are going the wrong direction, to fight corruption in a place where we desperately need all the resources to make good use of it. People like you are the 
celebrated ones. And it makes sense for us to be honest, to, to live up to it, complete, and take pride in the fact that, yes, we have played a role in changing our own communities. But personally, God makes people like that, I think. Uh, some people, you know, no, it's okay. I, I can live the way I'm, I am now. I don't need too much money to change my life and make a mess of my life. Uh, the way I am, I'm 100% happy, and uh, I'm happy to do what is right. I pray to God to continue to give me opportunity to do what is right. Continue to do what is right. And I will die a happy person at the end of my life that I've been able to do what I believe is the right thing. Thank you. Uh, in principle, according to the instructions I received, uh, we should probably stop here for a coffee break. But I think that uh, uh, in case uh, I take a poetic license, and uh, uh, still the floor is open for another question. Please. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and a very good morning. Um, my name is Pushpa um, from Intan Bukit Kiara. Uh, first and foremost, um, thank you gentlemen for a very inspirational um, talk. Um, I'm a civil, service, uh, a civil servant and often at time um, I'm exposed to civil servants in Malaysia who actually fear um, reporting um, corruption, yeah, in, 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 whether it's a small scale or a wider scale, um, for fear of material gains, uh, for fear of jeopardizing their material gains, their promotion, their appraisal. Um, my, ad my, my question is, um, what's your advice to this kind of, these groups of civil servants? Uh, they exist. Um, um, they exist. I think there are more of them than the the ones that who are brave enough to to actually stand up and speak. Um, also, another question is: You actually, uh, Mr. Nubu Nuhu? Yes. Hello. You actually mentioned that um, you are involved in the recruitment of enforcement officers. Yes. Uh, perhaps you could share with us what's um, special about um, the prerequisites that you look for? Okay. Perhaps we could actually learn from you? Yes. Yeah, um, that's all my question. I, I open it to Thank the you board. very much. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you for, for the questions about uh, some of the oldest problems uh, that we confront in our work. I, I have just three comments on the first one, and then I'll give the floor to, to my good friend, Nuhu. I think it's important that a country has thorough and rigorous whistleblowing and disclosure uh, laws and processes and procedures that the public understand and that the public have confidence in. Um, it's absolutely critical, and you know, ma'am, if you want to engage with me afterwards or write to me, I'm happy to assist uh, just because it is so important. The second thing is um, I think we should, we should reach into the minds of the public and, and encourage them to show courage because, you know, sometimes you do all these anonymous disclosures and you write a little letter and you gossip a little here and there, but you find your voice when you come out and say, you know, I have seen this happening and it's not who we are, and I'm against it. And, and often you will find that there's a dragnet of support around you. There's a protective system. There's a, there's a catchment area for you, and, and people will protect you. Society will protect you, especially in this day and age. And then to the law enforcement officials uh, in the room, I wanted to say that a friend of my wife sent us this WhatsApp over the weekend, which made me quite teary. She said... Um, I think she read about the report and she, she quoted some, you know, there are all these clever people who you can quote all the time, but I like the quote. It says, men of integrity are like the rock of Gibraltar. Men without 
it are like the shifting sands of the Sahara Desert, tossed to and fro by every varied wind of life. So, you know, be stronger than what people think we are. And, and let's get the same out of our society and we live and get them to come forward and, and deal with these issues. All right, thank you. Give it to Noor. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me first also, in addition to what you've said about protecting the whistleblowers, uh, I think the, this country, the state, must do extra. There has to be special laws that will protect individuals who will come out to expose corruption or criminal activities. A lot of countries are doing it now. I hope you have, you have it here. That laws that can give you extra protection, that if you come out to talk, nothing will happen to you, and things like that. In Nigeria, we have gone a bit further forward. The civil society and some of us, we said, okay, let's come together and see what we can do to also help them. We take up cases on their behalf. Wherever there is a whistleblower who is in trouble, we all rush, rush in to go and stand by him. If they are going to punish him, we stand, we say no. We need this thing to be done properly and correctly. I think civil societies should also take it as a challenge to support people who are courageous enough to stand out to come and expose uh, corruption and criminal activities. This is very important. Uh, when, like what you are doing now, the center helping us, people like me, to tell us, look, you are not alone, that the world is watching what is going on, and we are reaching out to you and help you. I think it's the same thing with the whistleblowing thing. If internally the civil society organization, NGOs, will come together to support them, it makes a lot of sense. On the second question about the encouragement for people to join law enforcement and get people to be engaged, and it's, it's something that requires a sort of mobilization as well. Reach out to the young people, talk to them. Tell them there is glamour in this work. There is satisfaction. I wrote a book. Actually, one also, another book somebody wrote on my behalf. And if I have this support, I intend to write more. We give it out. We reach out to the young people. I have brought some of this book. There are not many, but as a gift to you now. And I hope that somebody is going to distribute it. Uh, to, to tell the young people that, in, in fact, uh, in our own societies, in our own communities, one of the best things you can do to help your own country maybe today is to also join a profession that will fight corruption and also fight lawlessness. We are not like America, England, or others. They have already overcome all these problems. Our own is, we are going to get there. And for us to get there, we have to do the basic things. At all times, there are important things in the history and in the lives of societies and countries. Today, if you ask me, I will tell you countries in Africa, developing countries, require need more in law and order, in fighting corruption, than any other thing. Because it's the foundation that can help us to go out of the problems we found ourselves. Encourage, reach out. We, we personally go to where we can get these young people and encourage them. And tell them there is something good for our, for your country in joining police, in joining customs, in joining as a prosecutor, not just a private lawyer looking for money, in joining anti-corruption commission like this one to propagate and mobilize people. And you can be amazed the impact it can make. Just my own story, because I, I do not look like a policeman. In Nigeria, policemen are big. And look at how I am. And I, I decided to join. So every little kid can join. If new Ribadu can make life in it. Everybody if, can do it. Absolutely. <laughs> so, so these are the, some of the things that, uh, and that's the point about also mentorship. Be a role model. Send a message of good thing. Today, I've been acknowledged and recognized, and my name is all over in Nigeria. Oh, oh, people are so incredibly happy. And the young, young ones growing want to be like me. And I'll go out to tell them, please, go that direction. 
And you will now put your name in gold forever and ever because you have done well for your own country. It's very important. It may not be very uh, clear, but actually uh, certain things has to be encouraged in your own society. And uh, I think people should take it very seriously. Mothers, please send your kids into those professions. Encourage them to be uh, not just medical doctors or uh, lawyers to go into private practice. There is also life in law enforcement. There is also life in fighting for what is right. That, those are the things. And also, encouraging the law enforcement and the commissions to do propaganda. For example, the EFCC that I work with, I, some, I'm still close to them. We still encourage them. Do a lot of advertisement. Tell people that this is a, improve your conditions of service so that it will be very attractive and so on. And then you'll be able to get your best. The most talented young people will be interested in coming to join your organization. Thank you very much. I think we could stay here still uh, uh, hours to continue our discussion. But uh, there are other champions, uh, and uh, we have a program that has to be respected. I have been the first one who has infringed it, and uh, I am very sorry. So, coffee break for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Viteri. And to the